What I'm going to do is, is essentially uh, uh, talk a little bit about the global uh, macro situation uh, related to uh, developing economies and throw out uh, some ideas from my most recent work that Ricardo disagrees with. Uh, and then I'll, I'll leave and he'll rip them apart. Uh, I think that's the general idea. Here we are. Uh, this is where we are after five years of financial upheaval, the latest uh, world GDP growth projections from the IMF are revised slightly downwards, but we're still uh, above 3% uh, with the prospect of 4.5%. We avoided a Great Depression. That was by no means inevitable, because between 2007 and 2009, we essentially re-ran the Great Depression by most indicators that you would look at. This is just one, US equities. If you compare the three depressions for which we have data, the 1870s, the 1930s, and our depression, ours is the green line. It tracked the Great Depression of the early 30s perfectly until the summer of 2009. And if you weren't completely scared witless in early 2009, you weren't remotely paying attention to the lessons of economic history. Why are we not in a Great Depression? You don't have to be John Maynard Keynes to believe that it was partly fiscal stimulus. Uh, you don't have to be Milton Friedman to acknowledge that it was probably slightly more massive monetary stimulus. I mean, if you just look at the uh, annualized growth rate of the monetary base, that's the, the red line, we saw and continue to see truly astonishing experiments in monetary policy, and not just by the Fed. These experiments have been conducted by other major central banks. This is probably the most important force at work in the economic world today. And the most difficult question to answer is how you get out of this. Because even talking about reducing the asset purchases by the Fed talking about tapering caused a significant tightening in conditions this summer. I'm going to show you in a moment that the Fed is not alone in facing the dilemma of how to stop uh, administering powerful medication. Despite all of this, it is clear that the growth of developed economies is sluggish and is likely to remain sluggish. Just looking at the, the former former G7 countries, they used to be the G7. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty mi miserable if you look at the current projections of the IMF and compare them with performance in the 1980s. It's not just, in other words, that this has been a massive shock and that 08, 09 was dramatic. It's also that recovery is anemic. That means that the big trend of our lifetimes, which is the great reconvergence, keeps on keeping on. At this point, you would be, I think, a brave person to bet against China overtaking the United States, at least on this measure, the PPP, adjusted measure of gross domestic product, in the next five years or so. From a, an economic historian's point of view, this is just getting back to where we were in maybe the 1600s. We can debate about exactly the date but if you do some simple calculations with Angus Madison's data, and these are ratios of per capita GDP, US to China, take the story back to the 1500s. Broadly speaking, the story of the Great Divergence is everything that happens in economic history from the 1500s until the 1970s. And the story of the Great Reconvergence is everything that happens after that. So the Great Divergence means that the average American is 22 times richer than the average Chinese by 1978. And today, it's just five times. That's the biggest story of economic history. And it's probably the biggest story of our lives. Now we get to the bit that Ricardo would probably disagree with. In writing the book Civilization, I had to come up with an explanation of the Great Divergence that would also explain the Great Reconvergence. In other words, you have to have an explanation of why the West got so much richer than everybody else, 
And then you have to have an explanation of why that's over. And I struggled to do that in any other way than this. Admittedly, this is a huge simplification. Uh, but it's the best that I can do. If you haven't read the book, the slide uh, here will save you doing it. Uh, <laughs> essentially, there are six complexes of ideas and institutions that arise in the West before any anywhere else. And in combination, this bundle of what I call killer applications help us to understand why the West became much richer than the rest. And some of these things may seem staringly obvious to you, but to a historian it is very striking that they are novel when they appear. It is novel in the Europe of the later medieval period to acknowledge that competition in economic and political life is okay and that there is not, in fact, an imperative to have a single monolithic imperial order. So that is one part of the story. For the sake of brevity, I won't do more than sketch these. It is novel in the 17th century to acknowledge that scientific truth needs to be based on repeated experiment and that hypotheses need to be published, not kept secret, so that they can be falsified or not. That's new. And the scientific revolution doesn't happen anywhere else. It's non-existent, even in the relatively geographical, uh, geographically near Ottoman Empire. It's novel to base an entire legal system on the idea that private property rights are nine-tenths or thereabouts of the law. The modern medicine that doubles life expectancy in a series of revolutions in the 19th and 20th century is essentially Western. There are relatively few contributions from outside. The idea of a consumer society in which everybody has multiple shirts made of cotton and multiple suits made of cotton is, again, something that doesn't exist anywhere else. When it arises in England in the 17th and 18th century, it's novel. And finally, the idea that you should work, uh, work purposefully, intensely, and seek to optimize your work is, again, a novel concept, uh, which was so novel that when Max Weber thought about it, he thought it only could exist in Protestant Northern Europe and North America. The argument of the book is that these things were not peculiar to Protestants or white people or any of uh, the kinds of things you might associate with older explanations. These ideas and institutions are available, open access software, to anybody that wants to download them. It's just that it took until very late in the day for non-Western countries to attempt to adopt these institutions, partly because alternative models seem more seductive. Uh, and partly because there was strong resistance, and this is something that Darren Asimolu and Jim Robinson talk about in their book, strong resistance from elites to these sorts of things. The Japanese are unusual because they try to download the killer applications of Western civilization before everybody else. They don't know which ones are the killers, so they just copy everything. That's the Meiji era. Wholesale replication designed to achieve strategic catch-up. It works. And eventually, we see similar behaviors in other countries, including the most populous countries in the world. And the Chinese uh, make the most important innovations in these regards. Notice they don't download all the killer applications. More about that in a minute. So a reasonable supposition which the OECD made in a recent, in a recent report is that this process of convergence will continue. Doing the latest OECD numbers, again, as ratios of per capita GDP, there is a plausible scenario in which we go from the average American being five times richer than the average Chinese to, by mid-century, the ratio being less than two to one. I'm a historian, and I'm here to tell you that history isn't like this. The lines are rarely so smooth. But we need to consider at least the possibility that this is the rest of our lives. How will this process continue? Well, it will continue as a kind of Asian fusion, Western plus Western story. The innovation which you get when you roll out the scientific revolution and combine it with an effective system of property rights will happen still more in the West than in the rest. 
if you just look at patents per thousand of population to get a sense of who the really innovative societies are, Japan and South Korea do really well, but all the rest are, are pretty much Western societies, and in particular European. China just makes it into the top 20, but of course you can see it's miles behind, say, Israel. So this process of innovation seems unlikely to stop. Craig Venter isn't going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, bah, forget uh, the revolution in bioengineering. What will be novel between now and 2060 is that the demand is going to have to come from non-Western sources. It seems highly unlikely for a whole host of reasons that there will suddenly be an upswing in growth in Europe a sudden upswing in growth in the United States. A key part of the next 50 years is going to be the role played by megacities in the non-Western world. In 1500, the biggest cities in the world were not Western. In 1900, they were. They're not now. And they certainly won't be in 2030. And there'll be nine cities with more than 20 million people by some estimates. These are Deutsche Bank figures. Maybe the biggest surprise of all right now is that a part of the world many people had written off in the development community, and certainly in the wider public, namely sub-Saharan Africa, is now experiencing very rapid growth. This is not just because of the commodities story. Last year, eight out of the 20 fastest growing economies in the world were African. And these included countries like Sierra Leone which, uh, or Liberia, which Paul Collier would have long ago consigned irretrievably to the bottom billion. If these countries are achieving double-digit growth, something really remarkable is happening. And I'm going to suggest to you that part of the story, not all of it, but a part of it, is meaningful and measurable improvement in the basic institutions that incentivize rational economic behavior. This was touched on a little bit in the last session, particularly when it came to the Hajj and the consequences of that strange experience uh, of gender mixing that is, of course, such an outlier in the normal Muslim experience. Well, even in North Africa and the Middle East, a place for which we can feel, I think, a good deal of foreboding right now, there is a measurable change going on. And even societies that seem officially resistant uh, to gender equality are unwittingly or perhaps wittingly moving towards it because of rising literacy among young women, which we know is a game changer in all societies where we see it. But before we conclude that the rollout of Western ways of doing things is going to keep on going and that we can look forward to the great reconvergence continuing almost to the point when the ratios go back to unity, I think as an historian I need to try to identify the things that could spoil this story. And I'm going to, with the very limited time that I have, try to identify what, the, what these might be. Unless you're one of those people who thinks that ease of doing business measures are just worthless, and there may be some people here who take that view, there is, it seems to me, something to be said for looking at those data. And if you just look at changes in the time that it takes to complete the seven procedures for which we have data measurable in days, there's a lot of improvement by these measures in the ease of doing business. These are just uh, Latin American economies. And you can see that the time that it takes to do stuff, and this is all the things that you, you know from starting a business to reclaiming a debt when somebody defaults on you, that, that in most Latin American countries, there's been significant improvement. If you just add together all the time it takes to do all seven things sequentially, there have been big reductions. There are some outliers. Sadly, Venezuela is one of them. You won't be surprised by that, Ricardo. Uh, but interestingly, also Brazil is an underperformer in this regard. Any Brazilians here will... Uh, not be surprised by that. The readers of the New York Times will doubtless be amazed since they think that Brazil is still a miracle economy. But the winners uh, 
Peru, Nicaragua, Mexico have made measurable improvements by this crude measure. And it's a very crude measure, but it, it's one that it seems to me has some value. The problem is that transitioning not just the speed of your bureaucracy, but the way the rule of law works is really difficult. It's all very well to talk, as people love to, about the rule of law. Economists are very fond of that phrase, but what the hell does it mean in China if there are only 200,000 lawyers in the entire country? Property rights are, in many ways, the heart of the matter. We've known that not since Doug North, but since Adam Smith and even John Locke. But in the world's most populous economy, where a fifth of humanity lives, the whole question of property rights is highly contested and uncertain. Historians know one important thing about the transition to bourgeois society. The contests over property rights in that transition are seldom without political conflict. And we know that the rule of law has a long way to go before it really can be regarded as the norm in Asia. So if you look at the world governance indicators, measures of rule of law, these are, of course, rather subjective scores, but they are what they are. The places that have seen improvements are, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, former uh, colonies. The places that are not seeing improvements include, of course, big countries like uh, China and Indonesia and India, where in fact rule of law has deteriorated since the mid-1990s according to this data set. It's easy, and one often hears it said, for Chinese economists to say we will transition from rule by law to rule of law. It's going to be really difficult to do that in practice. In, in practice, it's not in fact happening. At the same time, if you download Western financial institutions as part of the package, you're probably going to download some volatility that you never had before. Right now, if you just look at uh, credit to GDP and add together all the different institutions that have been creating credit in China over the last five years, China is more levered than the United States was on the eve of the crisis. If you just look at the last bar, it seems highly plausible that China is on the eve of a financial crisis. And in fact, we nearly had that financial crisis this summer when interbank lending froze after a failed bond auction June 14th. Now, from 35,000 feet, it looks to me like a Chinese financial crisis would have a bigger impact on the developing world than most other things that you could come up with. I said earlier that it wasn't just the Fed that was scared to taper. So is the People's Bank of China. I was in Beijing in April and I was briefed by a senior advisor to President Xi that there was going to be a financial crisis and that this was necessary because of moral hazard in the system. And it would be salutary for local government financing vehicles and the officials involved in them to discover that there was a hard budget constraint. That financial crisis got cancelled in June in the same way that the taper got cancelled in September in the United States. Because even a tiny little bit of tightening caused a complete freeze of interbank lending in a replay of what happened in the United States, not to mention in Europe, at the early in the early phase of the financial crisis. <coughs> what you have to realize is that the thing I called Chimerica a few years ago, China plus America, started out as a marriage of two opposites. But like some married couples, they have grown alike. <laughs> and now the world economy finds itself really in the middle of a very interesting problem. Neither the central bank of the United States nor that of China dares to administer a monetary tightening or even to reduce the degree of monetary easing. I really don't know how you keep the Chinese economy going. I genuinely don't understand how you transition to a consumer-led model and away from a fixed asset investment model without some significant slowdown in growth. 
Meanwhile, the other thing from 35,000 feet that preoccupies me greatly is the way that the uh, Arab Spring has metamorphosed into something more like a proper revolution, and that this revolution is going through the classical stages of revolution. You know, phase one is when you're in the square, the crowd is there, the New York Times are reporting with great enthusiasm. In phase two, you have a great argument about the Constitution that ends rather badly. In phase three, uh, there's a kind of bid uh, for power by one group or other. In phase four, it turns violent. And in phase five, you have a war. That's all revolutions of, of any real magnitude in history have gone through that cycle, except the American Revolution. In some ways, this was not surprising. When empires retreat, violence tends to spike. The United States is retreating from being the hegemon in the region, which it has been since the 1970s. Drastic troop reductions. And not at all surprisingly to me, it's pretty much what I argued in War of the World, we've seen an escalation in, in violence. The, the number of fatalities in conflicts in the MENA region is now higher during the presidency of Barack Obama than it was during the presidency of George W. Bush, which will, I think, illustrate the point that good intentions do not suffice in the realm of politics. Here's the other problem. There are limits to how far we can diversify our fuel types. If you just look at the extraordinary diversification that's happened since 1800, you will see that the chances of renewables displacing fossil fuels anytime soon are vanishingly small. And the real story in energy is just where we can find renewables at current prices. Um, where we can find fossil fuels, excuse me, at current prices. What is actually happening, if you just look at BP's outlook to 2030, is that most of the increase in oil production, even if all the tight oil in the United States comes out nice and easily, is going to be in the Middle East. So the projected increase of production over the next 20 years worldwide will be 75% from the Middle East. If the Middle East becomes an even bigger war zone than it already is, guess what that implies? Most commodities are nice, mean-reverting things. In fact, many commodities, as you can see from this chart, are now below their average real price since 1900. There are two exceptions that really stand out. One is gold and the other is oil. Oil is a huge outlier at this point. And I think the reason that it hasn't snapped back to anywhere like its historic average is the Middle Eastern political situation. Most people that I talk to assume that the Middle East next year will be like the Middle East this year. But in fact, it's likely to be more violent next year than it was this year. This year was more violent than last year. Revolutions have a dynamic that tends to escalate conflict. And at the moment, we're essentially witnessing the breakup of, of at least one, probably two major states in the region, Syria and Iraq. We're also seeing an escalation of Sunni terrorist networks. They're spreading and proliferating in alarming ways, reaching as far afield as, as Kenya and Mali. And we're seeing an escalation of the sectarian conflict region-wide between Sunni and Shia powers. Anybody who feels optimistic about the region under those circumstances has to be attaching a lot of importance to rising female literacy. <laughs> so I want to conclude with a very simple question. Is this a sustainable future? Because what it seems to me we're centrally assuming about the world looking ahead 20 or 30 years, is that, broadly speaking, it will be Asian megacities that will drive growth. These Asian megacities will continue mainly to run on fossil fuels. We'll innovate, but we won't innovate enough to wean ourselves off those fossil fuels. And at the same time, a combination of sectarian conflict in the Middle East and bourgeois revolution in East Asia is likely to destabilize the political economies of the key regions. 
for these reasons, on balance, I'm somewhat skeptical about the story that the great reconvergence just keeps on going. And I'd be very cautious about concluding uh, from my book, Civilization, that we're all going to end up in a happy Asian fusion restaurant combining the best of the East and the West. That seems to me, at this point, quite a low probability scenario. <laughs>